Hello everyone, uh, thank you for taking your time and really great to see you here. So what I will do today, uh, I will start speaking about uh, the fascinating telescopes we have nowadays and what are the great results that we got. So uh, actually, when we look at the sky, of course, we always see it in optical energy range. But if you look here on the screen, you find out that the ways to observe the sky is really huge. So we can observe it besides optical, we can observe it in radio, we can observe it in X-rays and gamma rays, at very high energy gamma rays. And nowadays it's golden epoch for astronomy. We really have telescopes to explore the universe at full beauty. So I will start, of course, with optics, just because this is what we can see with our eyes. And the trick to have a great observations is to have a big telescopes. The bigger telescope, the more photons we can collect. So uh, one of the optical telescopes I want to introduce, I want to start, is the Grand Telescope located in the Canarian Island. And a scientific observation start on May 20th, 2009. This is one of the examples what was observed with this telescope. Here you can see the two interacting galaxies. And this is actually a very dramatic picture because this is what is, can be called like galactic cannibalism. You have a huge galaxy, spiral galaxy M851, and it is just eating the small galaxy which is coming by. So this is what we see in optics. What will happen if we look in X-rays? If we look in X-rays, we can see these X-ray arcs. Why? This is the reaction of the black hole in the center of small galaxy after eating some of the clumps. We can say that this uh, black hole is not polite, so it's burping after the eating. <laughs> and this is the X-ray which is emitted because of this. Uh, another example, NGC 5394. So here we can see the interactions again of the two galaxies. And you can see that this small galaxy is wheelchairing through the big one. And again, we have the interactions. We have these tidal streams of gas and um, lots of uh, stars will be uh, born there right now. Uh, OK, I already told you that we are using lots of information, different energy ranges. This will be a very nice example why visible light is not enough. So this is the nebula Bernard 68. And when you look at this in optics, so what you see, you see lots of stars. And here, just nothing can be seen. Why? Uh, well, is it really that it's some phenomenon and no stars? Well, probably not. So it's just a huge cloud which is obscuring everything. OK, so what we will do, we will change the wavelengths. We will move from visible light to the infrared. OK, not much change. OK, we are already in the infrared. Still not much. OK, now this gap is smaller, but it is still there. We go deeper in the infrared. And finally, everything can be seen through. The infrared can just go through the clouds and you're able to observe it. So this infrared is, for example, usually the great way to observe the stars, the newly starborn stars, which are always enshredded in huge loss of materials. So in infrared, we can see it. Speaking about the infrared, we have a fantastic telescope. Well, everyone heard about the James Webb Space Telescope, which was launched in 2021. And despite being launched very recently, it's already all the mass media is filled with the fantastic images. So this is uh, an example of the Cartwheel Galaxy uh, and the two companion uh, galaxies nearby. And this is the comparison. It's both pictures by James Webb, but this is more in optical, and this is more in the infrared. So here you can see much more details about where the stars are really forming. And here you just see in optics what's going on. OK, so another example. This is Tarantula Nebula. And the central concentration of young star cluster found in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula uh, contains the most massive stars that we have ever observed. So James Webb was able to find the most massive stars, which is 260 solar masses. Also, James Webb 
can do all the spectroscopy. And what was found out that actually you can see that the distribution of different elements is not uniform. So there are different regions where different elements are concentrated. One more example, the planets. So this is, everyone can tell that it's Jupiter. So it's just uh, the details, much more details, nicer view than ever have been done. And this is another example. This is just the extrasolar planet. Uh, again, we just have nice images. It's uh, usually the, when we speak about the extrasolar planets, now we know quite a huge number of extrasolar planets, but you just see usually the variations of the primary star where the planets, and here we really, James Webb was able to observe this planet. If we speak about the radio telescopes, in optical I said that 10 meters, it was a huge telescope. But if we want good uh, angular resolution, like in optics, we need a radio telescope with 53 kilometers radius, which is not possible at all, of course. 100 meters Green Bank Radio Telescope, it is the largest steerable dish. And uh, a receiver, uh, this is 305 meters telescope. It's, you can see that this dish is not steerable, it's just staying. And uh, this was the largest single dish up to 2016. Still, so it's, it's huge, but all the results are non-imaging. It was, this is the best image you can get with a receiver. So you can see that it's not of any nice picture, resembles any nice picture that you see usually. And uh, despite this, it has done lots of very interesting and important work discovering the pulsars, but not imaging. Yeah, this is how a receiver looks nice now. So, and probably one of the main cables holding the receiver broke in December 2020. Uh, the 900 tons receiver just fell on the radio dish below. So it was a, an end of a receiver and it was decided not to reconstruct it. But in China nowadays, we have even larger telescope. We have a 500 meter telescope, which is called FAST. Uh, and it is as twice as sensitive and 10 times the surveying speed than it was in a receiver. It's a huge telescope, but you cannot expect any nice images out of it. This is the observations of the FAST. And with this observation, so it's not imaging, but a lot of information was taken out of this observation. Uh, it find out that uh, the biggest atomic cloud in the universe was found that actually 20 times larger than the Milky Way. Oh, sorry, than our, uh, yes, than the Milky Way. And it's challenging the current understanding of the galaxy evolution as the atomic gas with low density, it should have been destroyed by the UV ultraviolet radiation. So again, why it is like this? I don't have any answer yet. So this is the work in progress. Most of you have seen very nice images from radio telescopes. So how it happened? Uh, the idea, uh, the answer is that you use not a single telescope, you use an array of telescope, and then the distance between the different telescopes actually acts as the size of the telescope. And then you can just put them on a the big large scales, 53 kilometers, and you have your milliaccent resolution. This is uh, an example of the very large array, VLA. So there are 27, 25 meter dishes. And can you do better? Yes, you can. You can just put them on different continents. And this is very long base line interferometry. Again, you see the names of the telescopes are not fantastically innovative, but at least they are informative. And with this case, you can get the milliseconds resolution. And this is an example. So when you are looking for detailed images, you can play with the size of the array and you can play with the wavelengths. If you reduce uh, the wavelengths, then you will have better resolution. So this is an example of M87. And this is what you see with VLA at 90 centimeters. You see within this blob, you don't see any details. We go from 20 centimeters to two centimeters, you see much more details. Can you do better? Yes, we stay with these two centimeters, but instead of VLA, we go to VLBA. And you see much more details. So playing with the array configurations 
and the wavelengths, you will have very different resolution. Uh, this is Atacama large millimeter array. Uh, there are 66 12 meters antennas, and the antennas can be moved uh, up to distance of 60 kilometers. And this is the fantastic image, which was done by Alma in 2014. And this is the planetary disk around the newly born star. So you see here all these concentric gaps. And this is exactly what you expect at the places where the planets are formed. The problem is that this system is too young to have these gaps. So this was a big surprise. Maybe it's just a unique system. No. Nowadays, ALMA has observed lots of such systems. And in most of them, we see these gaps. And all of them are very young. So again, we now we have new observations. And we need new theories to explain it. Anything we can do better? Yes, if you send one of the telescopes to space. Then, of course, the size, the distance will be much larger. And instead of milliarc second, you can go to actually microarc second. And this is uh, 20 microarc second. It's equivalent if you still have a two euro coin on the moon. And you can see it with this thing. So you can do really, really very detailed observations. Radio optics, what else? X-rays. X-rays we cannot do from Earth at all. The problem is that our atmosphere, it is saving us. It's preventing us from any high energy uh, particles. So, but if we are still interested, we need to go to space. And if you want to go to space, you cannot use a normal telescope. So this will be the shape of the telescope. Because usually, you know that the telescope is a mirror. So you just have a 90 degrees that you see your reflection. X-rays will be killed by 90 degrees interaction. So you should follow them very, very, very carefully. And nowadays, actually, we have a gold year era for the X-ray telescopes. And unfortunately, it is coming to an end. Because by 2030, most of these instruments will be out of order. And we have a huge gap between 30s and 40s. So hopefully, people in ESA, in NASA, they will do something that we don't have a 10-year gap in X-ray astronomy. OK, so this is just some examples of what we can observe in X-rays. So uh, here you can see Chandra observations of the cluster of galaxies. And here it's combination. Of course, uh, this is optical observation you have. And this blue region here, it's observation of Chandra. And if you see some such a huge big cloud at X-rays, it means that the temperature is very hot. So uh, this is uh, temperatures 10 millions of degrees, and the total mass about 100 trillion times of the sun. And here I told you that this is a star forming region. And this is exactly where we have X-rays. So it means that interaction of the galaxies is able to heat up the region to very, very high temperatures. Uh, OK, if we want to move on with energies, then we're coming about Fermi telescope. And in this case, uh, it's a completely different way to measure the photons. Uh, actually, we are converting photons into the electrons and positrons. And then we are just measuring the current. So this is the way how you deal with very high energy photons. So this is the map of the total universe uh, in the uh, GV range. And uh, the Fermi is fantastic. It sees the whole sky every three hours. So we are able to follow different sources on a very detailed scale. So this is our galaxy. And all sources out of galaxies, it's extra other galaxies. OK, we move on. We go even to higher energies. We go to 1,000 times more energy, higher energy than Fermi. I show you the telescope on the Earth. Why? I told you that all energetic particles are destroyed by the atmosphere. But the problem is that the number of this so energetic particles will be rather low. So if you want to send a telescope, again, it should be un have unreasonable large telescope size of the telescope. We can't afford it. But when the very high energy particle is entering the atmosphere, it will create a cascade of the energetic electrons and positrons, which will create another photons and so on. And they will be moving faster than the speed of light. Hopefully, you are surprised. But the point is that they're moving faster than the speed of light in the atmosphere. 
So this is okay. And in this case, they are also emitting blue optical light. And this light can be uh, measured on the Earth, and this is what we will see on your detector. If you are using several telescopes, you have several directions, they intersect, and you have the answer where is your source, and this is what you can do with the images. So you have angular resolution, of course, it's not milli arc second, but it's six arc minutes, which is not bad. You still have nice images, for, for example, for the supernova remnants. This is our Milky Way uh, at TV images, and so you see lots, lots, lots of sources. And each source is able to accelerate particles to very high energies, and all of these sources are very interesting. Uh, can we do better? CTA, Cherenkov Telescope Array. Uh, hopefully, it will start its operation in two, three, four, five years, uh, depending on the funding. Uh, and the idea is to have not five uh, uh, telescopes for Cherenkov imaging like it has, but have a hundred or even more. Uh, half of it, it will be in the southern hemisphere, half of it will be in the northern hemisphere. I'm working a lot with the sources, with high energy sources, and each time I say, oh, I just need to be more sensitive, then all my questions will be solved. How can I do it? So, yeah, CTA, hopefully it will bring all the answers. Well, yes, it will bring us some answers, but it will bring even more questions. But, I mean, this is what makes life of scientists interesting, yes? So, thank you very much, and here is just a reminder of all the telescopes that we were discussing today. So as there's more satellites and the sky is generally busier, how much of a problem does that create for being able to see beyond? If we compare the number of science telescopes with the number of telescopes which Elon Musk is sending, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're speaking about one, two, three telescopes. He's speaking about 300 telescopes or even more. So yeah, so what is Musk is doing, it can destroy astronomy at all. So uh, yeah, so I think there was even petition against, from astronomers, against all these Starlink telescope, uh, satellites. Because, but when we speak about one, two, three science missions, I think this is okay. Okay, thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.